Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone and welcome back to the first. Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So alhamdulillah wa I mean, we have completed now the story of Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha. And as I said, the next set of companions that I want to go through are companions who traveled through the land of Habasha, the land of Abyssinia or modern day Ethiopia. And so all of the next uh, several stories are going to be stories of companions whose journey intersected with Habasha so that you can have a better example or a better idea of how Mecca and Abyssinia worked for the early Muslims, of course, prior to the Hijra, the migration to the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, al Medina. And in this situation here, we also have the chance to cover another one of our mothers. The mother of the believers, Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, the daughter of Abu Sufyan. And Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha has a story that starts off similar to Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, but then takes a completely different turn and offers a very different di dimension to some of the struggles of the early Muslims. And I want you to think about this, that as we're going through the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu you're seeing that each one of them had a unique story, a unique struggle. And sometimes that gets lost when you're just talking about persecution and that's it. But there's the struggle of being a widow. There's the struggle of being separated from your husband. There's a struggle of your parents still being on the other side. There's a struggle of you know, uh, all, all sorts of financial difficulties and class difficulties. The struggle of Ibn Mas'ud is different from the struggle of Abu Dhar. The struggle of Uthman is different from the struggle of Ammar. Uh, all of them have very unique struggles and different struggles. In the case of Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, she has one of the most beautiful stories, also laced with pain in the initial days of Islam, that we come across when we look at the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So let's talk about who she was before Islam and just give a brief description of her. She was born 14 or 15 years before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received revelation. So she's born in uh, around the year uh, that would put her at 595 or 596 uh, before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received revelation. And so that would make her about 25 years younger than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we don't have much information about her uh, prior to Islam. We know a lot about her tribe. We know a lot about the different challenges that her tribe in particular posed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the way that the dynamics of that tribe uh, really would uh, would not just play a role in the early uh, days of the Prophet Sallallahu or even in the late days of the Prophet Sallallahu but really uh, the story of Islam. And that is the tribe of Banu Umayyah. Banu Umayyah is considered the rival tribe of Banu Hashim and Banu Makhzum. So if you remember, we spoke quite a bit about Banu Makhzum. Banu Makhzum being the tribe of the likes of Abu Jahl, right? Uh, and Banu uh, Umayyah is also the tribe of some of the most powerful enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well as some of the most powerful companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it definitely was one that resisted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam quite a bit and one that was you know, known for its torture of some of the early Muslims. And so Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu is tortured amongst them Ammar and Sumayya and the family of Yasir are tortured amongst Banu Makhzum. And you have these two tribes that rejected the Prophet Sallallahu primarily because he was from Banu Hashim. Not because they objected to his creed, but because they, they, they worried about ceding territory or power to the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu and the implications of acknowledging a prophet from Banu Hashim. So you have these three tribes that were the most powerful tribes of Quraysh, the most powerful clans of Quraysh, always competing for something, right? Competing for uh, you know, royalty, competing in regards to hospitality, competing in regards to uh, their finances. These are things that would rotate throughout the year between these three tribes. And so when the Prophet ﷺ declares that he is a prophet of Allah, of course, her father, Abu Sufyan, the father of Um Habiba, would be one of the most powerful opponents of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
And we know that, you know, Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu was from this tribe. And Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu is notably, you know, not just one of the first wealthy people to accept Islam, but he's also the first person from Banu Umayyah to accept Islam. This would make her, being one of the early converts, probably the second person to accept Islam from Banu Umayyah, which is very significant, okay? She is from this tribe and she's not just from this tribe. Her father is one of the most powerful men of this tribe, Abu Sufyan, uh, who of course uh, would, would play a role in the story of Islam throughout the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So before I get back to Abu Sufyan, let's talk about her mother for a bit. Her mother is Safiya bint Abil As. And uh, her mother being Safiya bint Abil As is the paternal aunt of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And so through that, she is the first cousin of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu through her mother's side. And of course, Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu would be amongst those that would migrate to Abyssinia as well, as we have already covered. And as we said, the first of Banu Umayyah to accept Islam. And we don't know much about Safiya bint Abil As and most of the sources seem to suggest that Safiya actually passed away before Islam. So she was not there to, uh, you know, to be an antagonist or to be an enemy or an opponent or embrace the religion of her daughter. And uh, she is uh, Um Habiba, her name being Ramla. Um Habiba is the only uh, child of Abu Sufyan and Safiya bint Abil As. Abu Sufyan would marry many, many women uh, throughout his lifetime. And so she had many half brothers and half sisters, but um, you know, th th she is the only child, according to some sources of Abu Sufyan and Safiya bint Abil As with some disagreement on some of her other uh, half brothers and half sisters. Her father, Abu Sufyan, his name was Sakhr ibn Harb. Uh, and it's a befitting name <laughs> at the time, right? Sakhr, of course, meaning stone, the son of war. Uh, both things that represented much of the, uh, the, the uh, enmity of Abu Sufyan to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the early days of Al-Islam. He was a person who was powerful, noble, eloquent, uh, wealthy. He was, was known for being a great diplomat. He was someone that was very popular with the foreign emissaries that would come to Mecca. He had a relationship with some of the rulers and some of the heads of state around uh, Mecca. So he's a nobleman in the sense of his lineage, in the sense of his power, in the sense of uh, his tribe. And he was someone that uh, was also well-versed in poetry and considered to be one of the more literate people in Mecca. And why that's significant is because Abu Sufyan uh, would recognize something of the Prophet Sallallahu early on. Right? And that's why you find some of these early narrations of Abu Sufyan almost accepting Islam, right? Going and listening to the Quran being recited from the Prophet Sallallahu but his tribalism held him back in the early days of Islam and the power held him back in the early days of Islam. So he's a powerful man, but he's also a very literate man. He's a noble man and he is going to be a great opponent to uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam considered the chief antagonist of the Muslims later on after his companions, Abu Sufyan's companions died. What do I mean by that? Uh, you know, I, I don't suggest that you take your Islam from movies, but you know, when you're looking at some of those, those movies about Siyar and things of that sort, right? Uh, the message and uh, others, you'll find that there's always, you know, a, a rotating role of who's going to be the antagonist of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But what, is, what seems to be the case is that Abu Sufyan initially uh, was not first in line in antagonizing the Prophet Sallallahu in relation to the likes of Abu Jahl and Uqba bin Abi Mu'it and some of those other powerful names that you hear about. Okay, so he was, while he was amongst that group of elites, he was not the face of that group of elites antagonizing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, Abu Sufyan did not go out to Badr, where most of them died, right? And so after Badr, where most of the companions of Abu Sufyan who were antagonizing the Prophet ﷺ passed away, Abu Sufyan was considered one of the only elders left behind. Khalid radiallahu ta'ala anhu was considered a young man, Amr bin al-As, a young man compared to Abu Sufyan. So he's one of the last elders 
who is left from the opponents of the Prophet wasallam, And so he really assumes the role of being the, the chief antagonist of the Prophet wasallam, post Badr, post Badr. And of course we know that it was his wife, Hind bint Utbah, not the mother of Umm Habiba, because uh, Umm Habiba's mother was a different mother, but uh, Abu Sufyan's wife, Hind bint Utbah, who would pay Wahshi to assassinate Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu and mutilate his body and Uhud and chew from his liver. Uh, so uh, these were, you know, this is the family of Umm Habiba, right? I mean, you're talking about, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the chances of her or the likelihood of her embracing Islam with this type of environment. Now, of course, uh, just like in the case of Umm Salama who preceded her family to Islam, uh, Umm Habiba preceded all of her family to Islam. Abu Sufyan would become Muslim. Hind would become Muslim. Yazid, the son of Abu Sufyan, not Yazid ibn Muawiyah, who of course is a much later figure. Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan and Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan would all become Muslim at Fatih Mecca, at the conquest of Mecca. So prior to the conquest of Mecca, uh, she is the only one from her family who would embrace uh, Islam at that time. And Abu Sufyan, of course, uh, would, would maintain that role of still being the chief antagonist of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam post Badr, uh, sort of pulling the strings and commanding the opposition to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and plotting against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until Fatah Mecca. Now, if you recall, um, you know, the marriage of Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha softened the heart of a very prominent man, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Later on, the marriage of Umm Habiba uh, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would soften the heart of Abu Sufyan towards Islam quite a bit. But in this situation where Islam has just begun in, in, in Mecca, Umm Habiba embracing Islam early on is what many historians point to as potentially one of the reasons why Abu Sufyan was not as harsh to the Muslims as some of the other chiefs were in the early days of Islam because his own daughter was amongst the Muslims and Abu Sufyan had a soft spot for her. So that's something that, that some of the scholars uh, will point out that Abu Sufyan held back in comparison to um, the, the tribal elite that existed at his time, the other chiefs that existed as, at his time, and how the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was, was being opposed. Now, how does she come into Islam? Uh, what we learn from Umm Habiba ta'ala anha is that she was married to a very famous man by the name of Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh. Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh was the brother of Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu ta'ala anha and uh, also the brother of Abdullah ibn Jahsh and uh, Hamna bint Jahsh. Uh, so all of these, uh, these siblings uh, embraced Islam. And in fact, they all are the children of uh, Umama bint Abdul Muttalib, the aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if I could, you know, sort of highlight this to you or illustrate this to you, Umama bint Abdul Muttalib is the paternal aunt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all four of these children, Ubaidullah, Abdullah, Zainab, and Hamna, who would marry Mus'ab ibn Umair, are her children, and all of them uh, accepted Islam. So that's one of the uh, one of the things that bonds these four together. But Ubaidullah also belonged to another group of four. And these were the four that were known as the Hanifs, that were known as the monotheists before the Prophet Sallallahu received revelation. These are the four that abandoned idolatry. You should know two of them very well by now. Waraqa ibn Nufal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who we of course covered both of them very early on in the series. And then the other two were Uthman ibn al-Huwayrith and Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh. And these two, uh, like Waraqa, accepted Christianity. Okay, so Ubaidullah uh, left idolatry prior to the Prophet Sallallahu uh, receiving revelation and accepted a version of Christianity just like Waraqa ibn Nufal and just like uh, uh, Uthman ibn al-Huwayrith ibn Asad. And so when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam declared uh, his prophethood as Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala had descended revelation upon him, Ubaidullah was quick to accept the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as was Umm Habiba. 
And so they are generally looked at as uh, you know, part of the first 15 or 16 to embrace Islam. But we don't have any narration about their actual incident of conversion. So we don't actually know how they converted or when exactly they converted. And of course, that you know, part of that is due to the fact that a lot of these early conversions were done quietly and secretly uh, due to the fear of family and tribal pressure. And this was, of course, going to be the case for Um Habiba, who is the daughter of none other than Abu Sufyan. So Ubaidullah bin Jahsh and Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha accept Islam. Abu Sufyan finds out eventually, and this, of course, you know, hurts him deeply. Um, and he considers himself one of the staunchest enemies of the Prophet Sallallahu And he is embarrassed. He is embarrassed that his own daughter has accepted his faith. So he had a hard time uh, facing Quraysh, knowing that his daughter was amongst the ranks of the Muslims. Uh, of course, this was not the case with Abu Jahl, right? At that time, Ikrama would become Muslim much later. This was not the case with Uqba bin Abi Mu'id. So uh, you have an, you know, a man who is embarrassed that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, has amongst his followers his own daughter. And as we said, that could have lightened the pressure that would be shown from Abu Sufyan towards Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha and towards the early Muslims, even though we definitely do see a strong exertion of pressure on Um Habiba and Ubaidullah uh, when they accepted Islam, just like the early Muslims uh, faced. Now, when did they make hijrah to Abyssinia? So we don't have any narrations about, any specifics about their persecution uh, in Mecca as they embraced Islam. They were amongst those who took the second migration to Abyssinia. Remember, there were two migrations to Abyssinia, and then of course, the migration to al Madina. And there are only a few companions who have the distinction of having done all three hijras, right? Um Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha being amongst them. In this case, you have Um Habiba and Ubaidullah who uh, could no longer bear the persecution that they were facing in Mecca. And they make their way to Abyssinia with the second batch or in the second migration to Abyssinia, which was a larger group. At that point, they still did not have any children and she was still merely Ramla. And that is when she was pregnant with her daughter, uh, Habiba, uh, while they were making hijrah from Mecca to Abyssinia. So according to most accounts, she actually made the hijrah. She actually migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia while she was pregnant with her daughter. And Habiba, uh, like Salama, uh, to Um Salama, was born in Abyssinia. So SubhanAllah, you actually find a lot of Sahaba who grew up to be scholars of the deen were actually born in Abyssinia, right? Which is, which is significant in and of itself and gives us a certain layer of Abyssinia, layer of Habasha that perhaps we're not appreciating. So Habiba was born in Abyssinia and that is where Ramla uh, bint Abi Sufyan becomes known as Um Habiba and she will carry that kunya, she will carry that name for the rest of her life. Uh, and that is how she is documented in the book. So you're not going to find her in the chains of Hadith uh, narrated as Ramla, but instead you will see her narrated as Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. Now when they get to Abyssinia, this is where you see something that only happened with her being narrated. Um, the narrations that are found in the books of Sirr and the books of biography, uh, they say that Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha had a dream about her husband, Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, with a disfigured face. And she was shocked by that dream. So she sees a dream of her husband um, with a disfigured face, which indicates something not pleasant about him. And uh, as soon as she sees that dream, she comes to find out that Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, after having uh, left idolatry to become a Christian and then uh, left Christianity or embraced the Prophet وسلم, to solidify his monotheism and to solidify his connection to divine revelation after fleeing from Mecca due to persecution. So after this long journey had renounced his Islam and had accepted the religion of the masses in Abyssinia, which was the religion of Christianity. So he reverts back to Christianity. But there's a very particular thing that's mentioned, which is his addiction to alcohol. Okay, so he began to miss wine. He missed the drinking of wine. He missed the drinking of alcohol. And um, he would drink alcohol frequently. 
And, um, you know, the narrations uh, say, أَكَبَّ عَلَى الْخَمْرِ حَتَّى مَاتْ That he that he basically became a drunkard until he died. Which is a very unique story. Okay? This is unlike any other story of the companions of the Prophet Wasallam. And I actually want to sit with, the, with this narration uh, for a moment. This narration is found in all of the books of Sirah pretty much. Okay? However, um, I don't personally feel comfortable asserting this narration with certainty uh, about Ubaidullah for the following reasons. Number one, um, this narration is highly consequential, right? This is not an added detail to a story. This is not something that gives us an added layer of appreciation that simply has a moral to a story or gives us you know, some sort of historical benefit or character benefit like we find in many of the stories of the companions of the Prophet Wasallam, that the chains of those stories uh, the, the secondary stories are not scrutinized like the chains of hadith. And of course, the chains in sirah, the chains of narration are not scrutinized as heavily in sirah as they are in a hadith uh, because this is where we take lessons. This is where we develop wholesome biographies and you know uh, the scrutiny is not going to be as much from a traditional perspective, from a scientific perspective when you are deriving uh, some of these narrations. And so you might have some of these stories that show up that are popularized in the books of Sirah, but they don't actually have a, a strong chain of narration, okay? Uh, we would still use these stories if they are not consequential because them not having a strong narration, a chain of narration like an authentic hadith does not mean that they're weak. It just means that they are not as certain as the words of the Prophet Sallallahu and the, the ways that the ahadith come to us uh, with such a level of scrutiny to ensure authenticity. In the case of Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, this story is highly consequential and so we have to exercise some caution uh, with these narrations, especially since um, none of the, the chains, the actual sanad, the actual chains of narration are authenticated that, uh, that affirm that he indeed apostated and that he became a drunk and that he left Islam and died in that state. Uh, in fact, there's a narration Abu Dawood where Um Habiba simply summarizes it by saying that, you know, we, we had just gotten to Abyssinia and barely met Najashi and then he passed away. So we know that he died in Abyssinia. Certainly the popular narrations within the books of, of early biography of early Sirah uh, suggest that he died having left Islam. And even if we were to take that popular narration, his leaving Islam is not depicted as a sincere reversion away from the faith, but instead a sad addiction to alcohol, right? A complacency of sorts after they moved to Abyssinia and having fought all of the, uh, the hardships that come with being persecuted with their faith, now, you know, blending into uh, his new society and reverting to an addiction to wine and addiction to alcohol. So uh, this is not uh, a sincere reversion away from faith, even as that's even as it is depicted in the popular uh, narrations. However, as I would say, while we would take the benefit of that, and obviously, you know, there's much benefit to learn from that about guarding our, guarding our faith no matter what and not letting our faith go and, you know, uh, the importance of thabat, the importance of firmness and steadfastness. Again, I would just uh, say we don't affirm uh, this idea that Ubaidullah died upon apostasy uh, with 100% certainty. Um, we say wallahu a'lam uh, with that because we don't have an authentic chain to really affirm that or make that certain. However, the story continues, okay? In any case, Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha is in a very difficult situation. She has to manage now alone in a foreign land, raising her young daughter and she has no one from her relatives to take care of her, okay? Uh, her father, of course, is Abu Sufyan. She can't go back to Mecca and remain a Muslim, right? If she goes back to Mecca as a Muslim holding her baby girl, she'll immediately be taken in and, and forced to renounce her faith or at least pressured to renounce her faith and persecuted in a way that was far worse than when she had her husband Ubaidullah bin Jahsh when she left Mecca in the first place. So she's there in Abyssinia. She remained firm through that test and she's stuck. She cannot go back to Mecca as a widow. She doesn't have anyone in Abyssinia. They are living as a community in exile. She's really stuck. She's not, you know, at this point now, 
uh, many Muslims had, had migrated from Abyssinia to Medina. Once the Prophet ﷺ made way to Medina, uh, some of them went back to Mecca, got their stuff, joined the caravans to Medina. Some of them went straight to Medina. She's stuck. She's with the group of Muslims that are there in Abyssinia that have missed that window, right? And as she is in this peculiar situation, Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha has another dream. And in this dream, a caller is calling her Umm al-Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers. So she woke up in shock. Wait a minute, what? Right? There is only one group of people that are called Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, and those are the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Here I am stranded in the land of Abyssinia with my daughter. I am the daughter of Abu Sufyan. I have no connection to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa whatsoever. This doesn't make sense, but she took it as a good sign. It was a good dream, a dream that pleased her. And so she continued uh, to wait. And she, she says that as soon as she had had that dream, uh, a, knock, you know, a knock came on the door and the next episode of her life was about to, uh, to reveal itself. Now, let's talk about the inner workings of that next episode of the life of Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. The Prophet sallallahu had heard of the difficulty of Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha and he knew what she was going through then that she was in a completely unique and different situation. <clears throat> so he sends a letter to an najashi Ashama radiallahu ta'ala anhu with Amr ibn Umayyah. And the letter reads to an najashi uh, to, uh, to propose marriage to Umm Habiba on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if she agrees, I want you to be my wakil. I want you to be my representative. Allahu Akbar. Now, I don't want to get back into a Najashi, but a lot of this is about to be about Najashi. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had Sahaba that were still there in Abyssinia. He had Ja'far there. He could have appointed Ja'far to be his wakil. He could have appointed Ja'far to represent him in the marriage. But he appointed Najashi being the only wakil, the only representative of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in such a contract. So this was very significant, very special that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam chose a Najashi to be his wakil despite the presence of some of his most beloved companions and family members that were still left over in Abyssinia. So a Najashi, you know, obviously honored by this letter, Remember, he told Ja'far, he sent back to the Prophet Sallallahu that if I was not occupied, preoccupied by my rulership, then I would come to you to carry your shoes. He wanted to serve the Prophet Sallallahu So this is a way to do khidmah to the Prophet Sallallahu to serve the Prophet Sallallahu Imagine how excited a Najashi was, how honored a Najashi was to be this representative of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in such an intimate affair. So a Najashi, he sends a servant girl by the name of Abraha. This is not the Abraha that, uh, of course, was destroyed in Surah Al-Fil. Okay, uh, this is not that Abraha. This is Abraha, a servant girl, um, who an Najashi chose to go and knock on the door of Umm Habiba and to uh, propose to her on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ, who would be represented by an Najashi. Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha says that when the knock came and I opened the door that I was so happy when Abraha told me what had happened that I took off all of my jewelry and I gave it to the young girl and she screamed takbir. <laughs> That's how happy she was, right? Like her dream had come true. The Prophet sallallahu indeed proposed to her. How? We're not even going to talk about how. How would she even make it to Medina? How would this marriage even take place? None of that is important. The point is, is that a proposal has come to her to be married to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Abraha, this young servant girl. I mean, seeing the reaction, right? Being entrusted to, to carry out that, uh, that request on behalf of a Najashi uh, to Umm Habiba. You know, she comes back and she's, you know, she has all this jewelry from Umm Habiba. Uh, anha. And an Najashi then calls for the, uh, the Muslims in Abyssinia to a private nikah ceremony in his palace. This scene is an incredible scene. He dismisses all of his guards and he brings in the Muslims. And as he brings in the Muslims, and you can imagine the scene, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu amongst them, Khalid ibn Sa'id 
uh, amongst them. Abdullah ibn Hudhafa al-Sahmi amongst them. Some of these noble companions, great companions amongst them. Najashi carries out the nikah on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He gives the mahar from his own end. The mahar was 400 gold dinars, and this was the largest mahar that anyone had received from the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa It's equivalent to about $70,000. Please don't do $70,000 mahars today. This is a very uh, unique situation, okay? This is a gift, and Najashi is honored to be in a situation where he gets to be the representative of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so he, he brings the mahar from his own end of 400 gold dinars to the widow, Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. The scene of the palace of Najashi, it was decorated in the most beautiful of ways. And it was clearly uh, a festive occasion and one that the Muslims were not used to. Now realize the Muslims as they lived as, in this community of exile, all the indications seem to indicate that the only one that Najashi maintained a relationship with was Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu. It's not like they were hanging out in his palace all the time. He took care of them, they maintained themselves on the side and they were protected and they were able to live in good fortune as a Najashi uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu has promised. But uh, now they're in the palace of a Najashi, missing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and then Najashi addresses the gathering on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and uh, the wali of Um Habiba was Khalid ibn Sa'id radiallahu ta'ala anhu, one of the early Muslims as well, who was the closest relative to Um Habiba in Abyssinia. So uh, I'm actually going to read out what a Najashi says to the gathering. Imagine the scene, they're in the palace, Najashi has dismissed his guards, and this is not them seeking uh, freedom. This is them celebrating the wedding of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not there. So Najashi begins, he stands up and he addresses the gathering. And here's how he chooses to address the gathering. He says, Alhamdulillah, Al-Maliku Al-Quddus Al-Salam Al-Mu'min Al-Muhaymin Al-Aziz Al-Jabbar. So he reads the names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He begins by praising Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and reading some of the names of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. وَأَنَّهُ الَّذِي بَشَّرَ بِهِ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمْ أَمَّا بَعْدْ He bears witness to the oneness of Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and messenger and that he is the one whom Jesus gave the glad tidings of. This is Najashi addressing the gathering. And he says, فَإِنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ كَتَبَ إِلَيَّ أَنْ أُزَوِّجَهُ أُمْ حَبِيبَةَ بِنْتَ أَبِي سُفْيَانَ فَأَجَبْتُ إِلَى مَا دَعَى إِلَيْهِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَقَدْ أَصْدَقْتُهَا أَرْبَعَمِئَةِ دِنَارِ He said that the Messenger of Allah wrote to me asking me to marry him to Um Habiba, the daughter of Abu Sufyan and I answered the call of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and I have given as a mahar, as a, as a dowry, 400 uh, dinars. This is Najashi addressing the gathering as a full Muslim. Khalid ibn Sa'id, he then stood up. And Um Habiba is narrating, by the way, her own wedding here. I mean, this is a really interesting wedding. The Prophet Sallallahu is not there. Khalid ibn Sa'id, he stood up and he praised Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala and he sent salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said to an Najashi that I have married to you, Um Habiba, in accordance with what was said, Fabarakallahu li Rasulillah. SubhanAllah. So basically mabruk or mubarak to the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. Congratulations to the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the Messenger of Allah SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the nikah is completed now and the expectation is that they are going to go away. But remember, Najashi gets to represent the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. No one gets the opportunity to be the wakil of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. So once Najashi completed the nikah, Khalid ibn Sa'id responded, Najashi gave, he actually presented the 400 gold dinars in that gathering. Then a Najashi uh, sees that they're about to leave. He says, all of you sit down. He says, it is the sunnah, it is the way of the prophets of Allah that when a marriage is carried out, that food is served. The sunnah of the anbiya, the sunnah of the prophets of Allah is that when a marriage is carried out, there is a walima, the food is carried out. So Najashi starts to bring the food forward and he serves them all sorts of food. And he carries out a feast on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the wedding of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Um Habiba Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha takes place, the most lavish wedding, the largest uh, mahar 
and the Prophet is not even there. And there is no timeline as to when Umm Habiba can even join the Prophet So this is the wedding of the Prophet and Umm Habiba with the Najashi getting to represent the Prophet And this was a beloved feast to the Muslims. Obviously one, uh, you know, that is certainly a night to remember uh, for them in the palace of an Najashi celebrating the marriage of the Prophet to Umm Habiba uh, ta'ala anha. Uh, um Habiba says that she then developed a relationship with Abraha, the young servant girl who an Najashi uh, sent to, uh, to give her the good news. Abraha comes back the next day and an Najashi has sent with her to Um Habiba all sorts of jewelry, diamonds, oils, uh, skins, and everything that Um Habiba could want. So an Najashi is not done being the wakil of the Prophet ﷺ and just giving her the mahar. He starts to give her all sorts of goods. And Abraha is the one who delivers it uh, to Um Habiba. And Abraha, uh, as she is developing a relationship with Um Habiba, she asks Um Habiba one thing. Um Habiba asks her what she wants, right? What do you want? You know, SubhanAllah, you're you're in this situation where you're delivering all of this, these goods and uh, you know, you're witnessing, you're a part of my joy. And she says to Um Habiba, she says, I only want one thing from you. Um Habiba says, what is that? She says that if you find yourself in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, and you remember me, then give my salam to him because I'll probably never get to meet him. SubhanAllah. She's like, I, who am I, right? I'm this servant girl in Abyssinia. And eventually when you're in the presence of the Prophet وسلم, give my salam to him, greet him on my behalf. Just remember my, my name. If, if you think of me, then mention me to him <clears throat> because I'll probably never get to meet him. SubhanAllah. And you know, that's her one request. Give my salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, she says that when I met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after all those years, uh, by the way, six years later, six years later, it was six years from the wedding to when she actually got to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It took six years for her to join the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was her husband, all six of those years. And she says, when I met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I, I told him about all the arrangements and all the, 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 the things that had happened and the way that Najashi represented him and everything that took place. And I told him about Abraha and I told him that she became a Muslim and that she told me and she reminded me frequently that if I ever meet you to convey her salam to you. So the Prophet Sallallahu he was joyful and he responded, وَعَلَيْهَا السَّلَامُ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ Right, and upon her be the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. SubhanAllah, when we send salam to the Prophet وسلم, an angel carries it to him and he responds to us. When Abraha sent salam to the Prophet وسلم, Um Habiba carried it to the Prophet وسلم, and he responded uh, to her. So SubhanAllah, I mean, it's such a powerful story, a unique story here that Abraha has this connection to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know, you can reflect on, on this, this idea that just like a Najashi who never met the Prophet Sallallahu but loved him so dearly, here was this young, simple girl in Abyssinia, thousands of miles away from the Prophet Sallallahu that loved him so much that the only thing she wanted more than jewelry or gold or anything to celebrate, hearing about the Prophet Sallallahu was that someone would carry salam to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we have that available to us. When we say, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed an angel to every single time someone sends salawat upon him to deliver our salam to him and the Prophet sallallahu responds to each one of us. And it's also, you know, the fear that she had or, or the thought that she'd never get to be with him in this dunya. Uh, how is it now? And Allah knows best, you know, as the souls gather, how is it now when those that are with those whom they love where people are no longer separated by land or by the circumstances of this world but they are with those whom they love that a Najashi and Abraha uh, would be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
<clears throat> so as we said, Um Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, she wouldn't get to be with the Prophet sallallahu until seven years uh, after Hijrah, so six years after uh, that wedding had taken place. And there is something very interesting about this, that Abu Sufyan, who was a tribe chief, who was an opponent of the Prophet sallallahu but as we said, a very intelligent and literate man, um, when he heard about the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu to Um Habiba, he actually was not sad, he was actually happy. And he said, that is a noble steed that cannot be rejected. And this is where Ibn Abbas ta'ala he says that this is actually the, uh, the context of the ayah, عَسَى اللَّهُ أَنْ يَجْعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ عَادَيْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ مَوَدَّهُ وَاللَّهُ قَدِيرٌ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Perhaps Allah will uh, make friendship between you, you and those whom you hold as enemies and Allah has power over all things and Allah is most forgiving most merciful. So uh, Ibn Abbas عنhuma, says this was actually speaking to the marriage of Um Habiba to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so she migrated to Medina from Abyssinia in seven, uh, seven years after the Hijrah as part of the group of Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And she would stay in Abyssinia as we said for six years after marrying the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But she would only be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for three years before he would pass away alayhi salatu wasalam and she would join her community in al Madina. So this is uh, really, you know, w- when you think about uh, stories, subhanAllah, you don't find, uh, you don't find many that, that are anywhere close to this in the circumstances and the semblance of them. And as we said, there's something about the, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, marrying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, and what that would do to turn the heart of Abu Sufyan uh, eventually to Islam as well. Inshallah ta'ala, next time we'll uh, continue with the life of Umm Habiba, just like with Umm Salama uh, after the migration, and we'll talk about her life with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and some of the legacy, uh, the, the aspects of the legacy of Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha. Inshallah ta'ala, uh, before that, I want to remind you all that this coming Monday, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we have our webathon, uh, A Light in the Darkness, and we are, we're asking everyone, inshallah ta'ala, to be a part of that. Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, you can register at the link below, inshallah ta'ala, and it will run for a couple of hours, and we're asking you to continue to support the work of Yaqeen, to be able to provide everything that we do, alhamdulillah, uh, without any charge, free and accessible, with your support, and of course, with the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anything else. So please do join us inshallah ta'ala. Sign up at the link below and join us inshallah ta'ala this coming Monday. Jazakumullahu khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.